Hello, everyone. My name is Joe DeBrita. I'm a member of the JMRD Watson Wealth Management Team. I work out of the London office and occasionally these days working out of my living room, something that I think many of you may have become accustomed to. I would just like to thank all of you for taking some time out of your evening to join us on today's call. I am joined this evening by Paul Manders and Adam Watson, both portfolio managers on the team. Uh, and a special guest who will be introduced shortly. Uh, throughout this evening's presentation, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function uh, in the app, uh, or if easier, you can send me an email or any member of the team an email directly, and uh, we'll be more than happy to get back to your questions. Uh, I will mention that we cannot uh, answer any specific questions on today's call as uh, they may be personal to your situation, uh, but we will be uh, more than happy to discuss those over the next few days. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, hand the call over to Paul Manders and uh, Paul, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Joel, and welcome to everyone participating tonight. Hopefully the technology is working and you can see and hear me. I feel a little like I'm doing the evening news, but I promise it will be more positive and uplifting than the evening news these days. We feel very grateful for clients and their families that look to us to help guide them through their financial lives. <clears throat> In these interesting times, we know many people are not nearly as lucky. So with this being Giving Tuesday, JMRD Watson will be reducing many of the typical client gifts we have done in the past and will be donating to various food banks and charities in our branch locations and other places that we have clients. It just feels like the right thing to do this year and we know our clients will understand. <clears throat> we have a very special guest tonight who would normally be traveling the world sharing his message and insights. In fact, he has given over 1000 speeches in 26 countries. And that was before getting good at these new virtual events. He tells us tonight that he's done over a hundred of these types of events virtually um, since March. So we're having a blast of winter weather here today, and that would have been causing our team quite a bit of stress if this was a traditional live event. We're lucky in these times to still be able to hear his message tonight through this virtual format. Tom Deans is a PhD from the University of Warwick in England. He's written two best-selling and informative books. His first was Every Family's Business, and his second in, is Willing Wisdom. You can see my bookmarks in there, and I hope he is working on a third, as the first two were very useful for myself and our clients. Tom is not just an expert from research and secondhand experience. He lived these big issues as part of a family with multiple generations that built and sold large businesses and were very thoughtful about each step before, during, and after. The thoughtfulness has carried on to how his family thinks and talks about their estate plan with the money passed on from those past generations. We've shared Tom's message and Willing Wisdom book with clients and friends for a few years. Recently, we did another order to share with clients on this call. The feedback has been mostly positive. I only say that as a joke as some folks just cannot bring themselves to share their most sensitive information with their kids and other beneficiaries while they are alive, which is one of Tom's key messages he believes in. That is just one of the insights Tom will be thinking about your family's long-term planning. Personally, I've used Tom's recommendation of an annual family meeting for the past three years, and I'm currently organizing my fourth for this month. I can honestly say that it has been a great way for my wife and I to share the spirit of our estate plans and our financial situation with our three teenagers. It has also provided our kids an opportunity to share their thoughts on important topics like our charitable giving and real estate decisions as they have grown. I will also mention that these types of events get easier as you have a few of them under your belt. I'll also throw in that it, doing it over a good meal always helps, especially with teenagers. If any of the ideas or suggestions that Tom highlights tonight interest your family and you would like to discuss them in more detail, we are here to help in any way we can. 
With that, our guest tonight, Mr. Tom Deans, live from somewhere in Ontario. Tom? <laughs> Paul, great to join you. And that somewhere is the beautiful Hockley Valley, just, uh, just north of Toronto, just outside of Orange Hill, and it is snowing. So we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, and that is that was a that was a great introduction because you really teed up um, you know the subject, and what a subject! I mean, did anyone see a global pandemic? I mean, a year ago, estate planning was sitting at about priority 125 for most Canadians. It was it's just not a fun subject. I mean, really, who really wants to gather with their family and talk about aging and dying and I mean, it's always it's always been presented as a kind of a dour subject that we that we tackle reluctantly, and then along comes COVID, and estate planning, uh, according to some polling, is popping up as the third most important subject that is keeping Canadians up at night. These are kids that are worried about their parents not having wills, power of attorneys, healthcare directives. You know, kids worried about their parents ending up on a on a respirator and not being able to intercede and to advocate for their parents' health care because they don't have those documents in place. And it's been a r real reminder that estate planning is more than just aging and dying. It's it's really a subject about the living. And I think if there's one, I think, audacious idea in Willing Wisdom, the book, that I know you're sharing with your clients, it's it's that, that We've, we've misconstrued the subject, and, and it's a good explanation of why 12.5 million Canadian adults are missing the most important document in the estate plan, and that's a will, and why the other half of Canadians, roughly 12 million, who do have a will, why 80% of those documents are not just outdated, I mean woefully inadequate and badly outdated. And so today, if I do, a, if I do my job well, I will create... A, a renewed sense of excitement about this issue and shift people's idea of what a will is, what it can be, and how we can use the discussion of wealth to actually bring our family together and deepen family relationships and build trust around the concept of wealth. It's a big, uh, it's a big, it's a big task. It, we got a lot of ground to cover, but that's a good place to jump in. Thanks, Tom. So the official title of tonight's uh, webinar is Building Smart Estate Plans. Um, could you give a quick overview of um, the current state of estate plan, uh, estate plans and planning in Canada? Well, I, you know, I mean, I gave the statistics, so we know that it's, you know, it's not good. I, I think if we look to our neighbors to, to the south, we are a little bit behind them, and that, as a Canadian, pains me to actually say that. In the U.S., of course, they have an extra layer of taxation at the estate level. They have a death tax. Now, it's, it's at a very high level currently, but it hasn't always been there, and it can always move. So there is something in American culture that informs them that, it, that, that dying without a will or dying without... Uh, a, a really well thought out estate plan by leaning on advisors and tapping into their expertise is really silly. Whereas here in Canada, we just we really have capital gains tax. I mean, it can be punitive. It can be, it can be pretty punishing to to families that don't plan. Uh, but we're we're just more lackadaisical when it comes to this subject. And in the U.S., because of that extra layer of taxation, they have adopted the use of family meetings. They they just simply uh, rely on facilitated family meetings that are that are facilitated by their advisory teams, and um, they end up, quite frankly, with better estate plans. And so, so the quick answer is the state of affairs is not good. I think if there's a silver lining in this pandemic, it's that really we are going to change. We are already changing. The lawyers that I speak with are absolutely, no pun intended, buried with work, with estate work, they cannot keep up. And this has been, of course, made much more difficult by the fact that it's getting very difficult to, to witness and execute documents because face-to-face uh, -face meetings are, are more challenging. There's been some amendments in Ontario to allow for um, virtual witnessing. But that is, it's still really, really hard. And the vast majority of Canadians are going to really dither and miss the boat on this. And if I don't know if we have any estate lawyers estate planning lawyers listening in today, but if we do, I'll, I would bet my house 
that if they've been practicing for more than a year, they've done a bedside will. And this is where um, someone that, you know, we care about ends up in the hospital. Everyone knows there's no will, not even any contemplation or discussion of the will. And then the lawyer is called into the hospital to go and do the impossible, which is to itemize all their assets and try to figure out where that's going to go with the patient popping in and out of consciousness. If, can you imagine something more horrific and lawyers just loathe this they just they just loathe that that task because they got the family members out in the hallway you know popping their head in trying to understand where where things are going to go and lobbying and this is the opposite of what i'm trying to describe in my book unfortunately estate planning is not like an oil change we just don't you know book it and think we know when we need it uh, life unfolds in some pretty interesting ways and it is in the middle of this crisis and so my call to action is today, after hearing this, if you don't have a will, you get one. You book an appointment tomorrow, not next week. You book that appointment tomorrow. You, you make the effort to have a will. Even if it's imperfect, it will be better than nothing. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, about, about the challenges that occur when we leave chaos in, in our estate plans. Unfinished business, unsigned documents. And so, so the quick answer is things are not good, but I think things are about to get better because we've been reminded about just how important and crucial this is. And I'm not just talking about tax bills that are, that are, that are triggered by poorly conceived estate plans. I am talking about the devastating consequences that, uh, that families have to endure when wealth and the transition of wealth has been wrapped in total secrecy. So, so what prevents Canadians from having these meetings and going through the process to put these documents into, into place? I, I wish I had my camera on. You could see me. I'm actually holding my will. I'm holding it in my hand. There. You can actually hear it. Guess what? I'm still here. There is a whole bunch of people who think that if they talk to their family about their will, if they go to a lawyer and talk further about a will and go further and sign it and hold it and read it, that somehow they're going to expedite their death. There is an extraordinary amount of superstition around this subject. It's like people think it's like manifest destiny. And, and I come along and say, no, the opposite is true. I, I truly believe that families who actually execute these documents and then go the step one step further and share those documents with the people who are going to be impacted by these documents, that in fact, they're going to live longer. Part of my message that I'm sharing in the book in my public lectures is that when we view estate planning as very much a subject for the living and we empower our children to serve us when we and advocate for us in, in, in healthcare decisions, then I just think better there are better outcomes. The flip side is, unfortunately, the vast majority of Canadians who have their documents in place already, they keep them secret. They, they put them in safes. They put them in safety deposit box. They're, they don't share the passwords or the keys. They, uh, there are some people, maybe some people on this call, who are actually hiding their wills in air vents, uh, in walls, in places that are so irretrievable that people are going to dismantle houses trying to look for a document that they think exists. There is something very peculiar about this subject where we think that somehow engaging people on the subject of who will get our wealth when we're not here is somehow going to corrupt the drive and ambitions of the next generation and make them lazy spendthrifts. And of course, I believe, and, I, and this is really informed by my own personal experience. And by the way, I want to be very clear. This, where I'm coming from is very much born from my own personal experience. And I really want to create space for people to disagree with me. It's not like I have a lock hold on the truth. I'm just saying our families heavy, heavy reliance on family meetings and disclosures and transparency, I, I think, has just led us to not only create wealth, but create the next generation of entrepreneurs who have a pretty healthy relationship with, with money. And I just don't think that that is a gene. I don't think that is a fluke. I think that has been very much a feature of our family that we've worked on and that has been an outcome of design. 
Now, what what does your typical family meeting uh, look like uh, in, in in practical terms? Uh, who's invited? Where do you host it? Uh, how, how often does this happen? So, um, I like to make it very clear: there is no one set or perfect idea of what a family meeting is. There are some family meetings, some of the best family meetings that I've uh, attended, both as a family member and as a speaking resource who has been invited into these family meetings to present some of my ideas, they're, they're, they come in every shape and size. I, I've been in big family meetings, multi-generational family meetings. I was in a family meeting in Chicago. Uh, there were 17 family members, three, um, uh, three generations. And guess who was chairing that meeting that day? It, it was a 15-year-old girl, a 15-year-old granddaughter of the, of the, of the patriarch and matriarch. I have been in family meetings that have been held at cottages, uh, around campfires, in oak paneled boardrooms, people with suits on, people with bathing suits on. The, the, the point that I'm making is it's, it, it's, not, <laughs> it's not what you're wearing. It is the intent and the gesture of the senior generation to just merely make an effort to open up discussion and not to have the answers and to have the answers preordained, but actually to hold these meetings, looking for solutions, looking for ideas, stimulating conversation. And I'll tell you what is so fascinating is that most of the teaching in the room is not the senior generation of young folks, but in fact, young folks talking to, the, to their senior generation about, about some of the things that are changing in the world and how they would deploy an inheritance and how they would deploy uh, inherited wealth in the advancement of their own family and community. And these are, these are just ex such exciting conversations to witness. The first, I'm 58, so I've been to 53 consecutive family meetings. Uh, so my brother and I, we were really young when we were invited into family meetings. That's often a question that I get asked is, what's the, the appropriate age to invite someone? I've been to lots of family meetings where there are kids like walking around the boardroom, like little kids, toddlers whipping around and people just ignoring them. And then at some point, these kids will one day pull up a seat around the table and start to listen. And uh, I, I think for me, it was, it was around 12, 13, where, where I, it, these, these meetings actually turned from being these just boring, awful presentations to, to something that was, I knew I was part of something pretty special. And, um, and then the, learn, the real learning um, became kind of embedded. And, and uh, I often tell the story about how my brother and I inherited from, my, from our grandparents. Our last surviving grandmother died when she was 99 in 2011. And, uh, and my brother and I inherited a relatively small percentage of that estate. And if I don't have the time to, to get into the subject of generation skipping, please remind me because it is a big problem. This is where grandparents look at their own kids and go, oh, they, they're doing fine. They're both employed and they've got a big house and they go to, you know, Mexico more than we ever did. So you know what? We're going to leave our money to the grandkids, and they hop over top of their own kids, and this is creating just extraordinary stress and complications and strained relationships in, in multi-generational families. So I'll come, to, I'll come back to that later, but the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that there, there are no two family meetings that are, that are the same, and even in individual families, the family meetings will change over time. They should start small, mom and dad and kids their children. But as quickly as you can expand those to include the spouses of your children, I would really encourage uh, that to take place because the exemption of, of spouses is kind of a statement that there's a lack of trust. And, and, and in even more practical terms, running parallel to a state law is the Family Law Act, and spouses have entitlements. So if there are concerns about the spending habits of your son's wife or your daughter's husband, or there are concerns about addictions. I mean, look, we're, we're talking about families which are imperfect. Uh, then deal with it. Uh, their exclusion is not dealing with it. Their exclusion is, in fact, compounding the problem. So as quickly as you can in invite spouses in where you can have concerns and express those concerns, which for some people listening right now, they're like, oh, this, this is just crazy. There's just no way I'm going to be able to tell my daughter-in-law that we have concerns about her spending. Listen, uh, lean on your advisors. I mean, there are ways of making the point without being explicit, and there are solutions to these problems that your advisors have uh, know, know fully what they are. They're called trusts. 
there, there are ways in which to transition wealth in ways that don't harm the recipient. There are ways to transition wealth and keep the concepts of equality and fairness in balance without leaving money to someone who's got an addiction. And your advisors know how to do this. They know how to use trust in order to protect wealth that has been, uh, I mean, people on this call have worked really hard to create surplus capital. And then all I'm saying is let's spend a little time looking for solutions to make sure, sure, sure that that life's work, that surplus capital, actually transitions in a way that releases potential in the next generation, starts new businesses, um, funds health care, education, all the great things that money can do for families when it's transitioned healthily. Now, an, a question that, or an idea that came up to me is you mentioned late life care and estate planning. How, how does the family meeting and sharing uh, thoughts on estate planning uh, connect uh, estate planning and life care? And um, how, how does the meeting facilitate uh, getting everybody's thought process through? Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think that's a really kind of a big audacious late leap for a lot of people. I, I, that's where I started. I said, you know, estate planning, people think it's just answering the question, who gets my stuff when I'm dead? And what I'm trying to say is, look, there is a big part of retirement where we are not playing golf and swinging a tennis racket. In fact, we're not swinging anything. There's a big chunk of retirement where, in fact, we're sitting or lying down and we are in the care. Uh, maybe power of attorneys have been invoked. And because we've got dementia, I mean, this is a staggeringly huge contemporary problem that we have in our society. We are living longer. We are losing capacity. And we are relying on our children to oversee our care. That, my friend, is estate planning. It is the same conversation. Can you imagine expecting extraordinary care from people, and yet we don't have the trust and respect to share the contents of our estate plan because we think it's going to ruin them? Do you see the disconnect and the illogic? The, the flip side is, is that when we can use these repetitive conversations in the context of a family meeting, which, and I'll remind people, the one of the the most incredible benefits of a family meeting is everyone hears the same thing at exactly the same time. So it's not, well, mom told me this. Well, that's funny because mom told me that. Or dad told me this and mom told me that. It's, listen, everyone hears what everyone's intentions and aspirations and expectations for our future care are. They're discussed. We discuss these things in our family meetings. I have a copy of my parents' advanced health care directive, as does my brother. We have copies of their power of attorney. They have copies of our documents. Nothing says that we die in order. Our kids, when they turn 18, we buy them wills. I should note that they're very disappointed. They're hoping for cars. Uh, but that, that being said, we just pay the invoice. We don't go with our adult children at 18 and, and hold their hand. We say, you're an adult, and part of adulthood means getting a will, a power of attorney, and a health care director. Even though your assets are modest, there's more to estate planning. Do you... Do you remember that horrific bus accident on the prairies, that Humboldt uh, Broncos bus um, accident? Uh, you know, I was horrified, as were most Canadians, because a lot of us knew what was taking place. We knew there were parents arriving at that local hospital. I knew there were going to be some kids on that bus that were over 18, and there were a handful that were. And I knew that their parents were arriving at that local hospital asking about the well-being of their children. And you know what they were bumping into? They were bumping into the privacy laws. And the hospital administrators were giving those parents no information because there was no power of attorney, no health care directive. You and I would get as much information. And I just think that was just, that was just tragic at so many different levels. If the folks on this call want to give themselves a gift, listen, buy your kids these documents. Pay for the legal bills. It's modest. And I mean, at first the kids will think, that just, that is, what a weird gift. Until one day the penny will drop and they'll think, that was unbelievable. One of my favorite lines in Willing Wisdom is, the way in which we transition values and ideas and wealth is actually more important than what we transition. I, seriously, I can barely, I couldn't tell you t precisely how much money I inherited, as, my, as did my brother from my grandparents. 
But I can sure recount chapter and verse the effort that they made through these facilitated family meetings for decades to help prepare us for what was surely coming our way. Compare and contrast that to the bulk of Canadians who do what most do, and that is they die, and then family arrive at the funeral home. The funeral director asks for a copy of the will in order to determine who the executor is because the executor is the legal authority to implement final wishes. And that is the moment where people learn for the first time, A, there is no will, or B, there is a will, and maybe only one child has been named executor. And not even that child even knows that they were named executor because secrecy is the, is the bedrock, the foundation of most Canadian estate plans. Secrecy. That is how people are, are learning about estate plans while they're grieving. And then the questions begin. Why did mom pick and dad pick um, Larry to be the executor? Why didn't they pick all of us? And, uh, and that is how the administration of an estate begins, with people feeling disconnected, angry, despondent, jealous, and all of this wrapped around a, a moment of deep grief. I just think as Canadians, we can do better. We are an extraordinary country of entrepreneurs. We are extraordinary savers, despite what we read. We are really good savers and investors, especially folks who work with advisors. We are absolutely terrible, absolutely pulling up short when it comes to transitioning wealth in a way that will do our country and our families proud. Today in this country, $205 million will be inherited. Today, tomorrow, and every day for the next 10 years, $755 billion will transition over the next 10 years in this country. It is a tsunami of wealth. And at the very moment in time where we're transitioning a record amount of wealth, we're writing fewer and fewer wills. And the consequence is our courts are absolutely jam full of families lawyering up and fighting over money. I, I've had the uh, the benefit of reading your book, and uh, I recall you mentioning uh, you wrote your first will at 18, uh, which is something we we stress uh, as well for clients' children to get wills and powers of attorneys. Uh, um, a little bit of a personal question, but at 18, did you present your your first will at a family meeting? And after 53 family meetings you've attended. Uh, how, how often do you actually change your documents? Um, so yes, so at 18, we did, I did present my will and my, and my only beneficiary was my brother. It was really, it was really interesting. Um, and and he had, he's older, so he had actually led the way. And, and so my, my will kind of felt like there was some reciprocity there. But as life unfolded, he, uh, you know, he married and changed. Obviously, changed his beneficiary from, you know, from me to to his wife as well. He should, and life unfolds. And then he had kids. And and in terms of my own will, I I remember one year I changed my will three times. In one year, I started a business. I sold the business. Um, actually, there was a, a birth and a death in my in, among my beneficiaries, which led me to change my will. There is something hilarious going on. I hear it all. I always had a dollar for every time I'd heard. A lawyer say, you should, you should review your will every five years or update your will every five years. I do not know what it is about five years that is magical like a unicorn. It's like business owners. I, I ask them about their succession plans, and they say they're going to sell in five years. I come back the next year. It's not four. It's always five. Same thing with wills. Listen, I, I read my will every year, and when I say my will, I don't, I don't read the document end to end. It's boring. There's about two paragraphs that are material to – where I'm leaving my my assets, it literally takes less than three minutes, and it just I just like check 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 things are good, and uh, look at my executor. Yep, I'm happy with that. No changes required there, and off I go. Done. But I think people on this call would be shocked at how much change actually takes place in the course of one year. I just think uh, I call my birthday my will day. I often do it on my on my birthday because uh, it's easy. I do a, I do a handful of things unique uniquely on my birthday. I think when we're young, we we look at birthdays as kind of a fun day, the day we get presents. But something shifts. I think when we move into our forties, certainly. Well, I remember turning fifty, and I just all of a sudden, um, 
I was pretty certain that I was playing on the back nine at 50. By any way that I do the math, I was pretty sure that that something had shifted. And all of a sudden, a birthday is not just about presents. It's really a it's really a kind of a day that measures our march towards the end. And and I think it's a it's a more introspective and reflective day. And I think it's a great day to to, to kind of review your will. And 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 what I think we hope will be. I don't know, our legacy, who will be our emissaries, who will continue our work, who will take our wealth and do magnificent things with it because we design it that way through conversation. I, I just think it makes aging feel a little less scary and a little less lonely when we can use our wealth to engage the next generation about those things that I just listed. Now, for, for many people on the call, uh... Um, the concept of a family meeting and sharing many, uh, many of their deepest, darkest secrets, uh, it would be a foreign concept, uh, and, and I'm not as advanced or my family as advanced as, uh, as Paul's family with having annual meetings. Uh, um, what would be the first step or the, the, the most important step to start it, uh, um, and is there a process that you, that the meetings go through to stay on track, or or how do they go? Yeah, well, so one of the things that I think, if people can just imagine for a moment, when, when an advisor, a trusted advisor, is present in the family meeting, even if it's an informal meeting, first of all, family dynamics change when there's a professional in the room, right? It, there there's some gravitas, there's some structure. It, it's not just going to be a free for all. I mean, I think where a lot of people derail with family meetings is they, they, they view it like a do it yourself, like, I don't know, renovating the basement. Like, this is not, this is not one of those things where people really want to tackle on their own. Uh, it's, it, it probably will devolve into something emotional. Uh, so I think by just, my first book was called Every Family's Business. My second book on estate planning is really a book about the business of family. It's not about an operating business. It's about bringing some structure and, and organization to the business of, of transitioning wealth. And I think when people look at their family as a kind of an economic institution, that's kind of when the penny drops. And that's where the senior generation kind of goes, oh, I have a duty and responsibility. If I'm going to die with surplus capital, I kind of have a duty and responsibility, kind of like a matriarch and patriarch back in the 1800s. There was a time when those words meant something. But there's a whole generation of Canadians who are really the first generation of serious wealth creators. And they're looking in their own family history for clues on how to prepare their estate and prepare the next generation. And there's nothing in their history. Their parents didn't have much to divide. So there, there was no family meeting. There was no need for one. There was no emphasis placed on preparing heirs. It's like everyone was kind of on their own. And yet here we are in 2020 with people who, even if they have modest wealth, we had smaller families. We didn't have seven kids that were dividing up a modest estate. We have, we have one or two, maybe three kids that are dividing up really big estates. And it is – so there is nothing in our collective family histories that are, that are guiding us. And so to do what our parents did is not going to work. We, my call to action is, listen, if you have wealth, you really have a duty. You have to understand that wealth, inherited wealth, will do one of two things. It will release potential in the next generation, or it will seriously accelerate demise because it was given carelessly, because there are addictions, because there are spending problems, because there is a lack of respect for the effort that went in to create that wealth. So a big portion of our family meetings in the early days were spent on telling stories, reminding us, the grandchildren, about where that wealth was created and how it was created. I can tell you going back you know, four generations, my great-grandfather, from tire distribution to chemical manufacturing, plastics manufacturing, to my business now, which is publishing, we are, we work, we work freaking hard. We are workers, despite what we have. There is something in our family business and our family meetings that remind us of this work ethic and this competitive drive to create more wealth than we are, have any intention of consuming. 
And I, I just don't think that that is a fluke. I just think it is really more by design. And, and I think it's exciting when we can really create estate plans that give the next generation permission to do something which I think is a little bit extraordinary and a little bit odd and rare. And that is we really encourage our kids to, to take risk. When they're young, we really encourage them to take – we transition wealth early and we don't hoard it all to the end. We actually make relatively small and infrequent gifts. But as we make those gifts, we mentor, we coach, we provide feedback. I mean, our, my advisor is my father's advisor. That firm is now advising our kids. Our, our kids. So that's three generations under administration currently. We've had four at one point. My grandparents were with the firm. Do you know what kind of advantages accrue to our family when one advisory firm is, is looking at 100 years of wealth and, and tailoring solutions and tax strategies and investment and working with the next generation on their investments? Compare and contra contrast that to you know, the family that has an advisor. They die. The kids get their, their inheritance. They move to a new advisor. It's, it's siloed. It's staccato. It's disjointed. It's broken. And, and so part of what I'm, I'm trying to really underscore is this huge benefit that comes from relying on someone else to unlock those family stories and to tell those stories and to embed those stories inside, inside the family. And so a lot of our family meeting is spent looking backwards before we start looking forwards and talking about investments and philanthropy and all the things that we want to do in today. It's, it's really about our history. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Uh, that was that's an interesting uh, viewpoint uh, as a as a second generation advisor who our families helped uh, serve four and five generations of many families. Uh, it's it's interesting being uh, helping families steward to multiple generations uh, um, down the line. Uh, and 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 I'll say maybe that's an in, you you mentioned don't let us skip generation skipping so I won't say that's an easy segue but that's one note that I that I wrote down so what what's generation skipping and what does it mean and what's the usual end result if it's a surprise? I, I think there's there's I think Canadians really fall into two general uh, camps and that is some people will look and and design look at estate planning and design estate planning as the transition of wealth to someone who needs it as opposed to uh, the other r roughly 50% of Canadians who view estate planning as an exercise in equality and democracy and fairness and um, and and I really mean it it's quite extraordinary and it's very difficult to move people who are in one camp or the other um, there there are lots of people who will just who will reward actually the weaker underperforming child uh, or grandchild. Um, so generation skipping, as I mentioned earlier, is where grandparents um, usually adopt the idea that, that estate planning is about resolving an economic need. So they skip over their own well-to-do children because they figure they don't need it and they give it to the grandchildren. And often they give it really carelessly. They don't, uh, they don't communicate these gifts. Often this is revealed at the death of a, of a grandparent. And, and then you, in, in some of the most obscene and distorted plans, I've seen grandchildren end up with more money than their own parents because there's just been a lot of lifestyle of the parents funded by debt. And if you think that um, I mean, that really undermines the parent-child relationship between generation two and generation three. They're, they're almost ir irreparably broken families. All well-intentioned and yet carelessly transitioned. So I'll, I'll repeat my favorite line. How we transition wealth is as important, if not more important, than what we transition or how much we transition. And I think the family meeting is the, I just think the most magnificent expression of care and commitment to build families that work well when we are gone. And that is my definition of estate planning. That is my definition of legacy. It's not about me. It's about my family that will hopefully go on and do really extraordinary things. Probably, very, and I hope, very different things from what I'm doing. You know, if we... If we think back to family businesses for a moment, if, if all we expect our children to be is some version of ourselves, we'd never have the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford's father 
was a farmer. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, his, his father ran a restaurant. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, his father was a lawyer. By a lot of people's definition, they're failed families because the children did something completely different than their parents. Part of estate planning and family meetings is using the concepts and discussions and conversations about the potential for an inheritance and exploring what people would do if they had it. And those are fascinating conversations, absolutely fascinating. And, and the real teaching and learning is, is going both ways between the generations. It's, they're, they're really exciting. They should be exciting meetings, not fearful, dire events. Now, Paul, Paul mentioned at the beginning that today's Giving Tuesday, um, and, and in the book you mentioned you use this same, same family meeting process to evaluate charities that align with, with your beliefs. Uh, some of the questions are very personal, so how, how does that help your family, and uh, what type of situations have you ended up in uh, through, through using charities in the same family meeting process? Yeah, it's a really great question, and, I, and it took me a while to figure out why this emphasis on philanthropy in our family meetings and why this, I mean, real dedication to the subject. And, and then I, I finally pieced it together. And I think what we're, what I think we're, my grandparents especially uh, were trying to teach us by focusing on philanthropy and and in, you know inviting charities in to to pitch our entire family who would at the end of the because it's kind of like the dragons and at the end of the family meeting we would vote and then allocate a certain amount of family money to to a particular cause after great great presentations and deep uh, critical thinking and analysis and debate I finally figured out what was going on what they were actually trying to teach us was that. Whether or not they're talking about taking a dollar out of their hold co to buy, I don't know, a, a watch or take a dollar out and, and invest it in, an, in a new uh, enterprise or take a dollar out and buy a car or take a dollar and spend it on charity. A dollar in our family is a dollar, is a dollar, is a dollar. And we, whether it's going to charity or personal consumption or investment or savings, it is given rigor. It is given attention. It is there is just this kind of connection to what wealth is, and <laughs> it's like, oh, that's what they're doing. So when we're writing checks to charity, it, listen, it is not just pitter patter of heartbeat and emotional. Um, we're looking, we are looking for impact. We're not just looking to feel good by writing a check. We want. We are looking for charities to be taking the same kind of risks and initiatives and bold efforts to make, to drive change, to have impact. And so our questions go in our family meetings and our, and our, quite frankly, our interrogation of charities is going well beyond, tell me, how much do you spend on administration? We're, I mean, that's one question. It, it, it goes way beyond that. We want to know how our donation is going to impact and impact a community and change something permanently. It, it, it's fascinating. And uh, I'll say uh, some of the questions uh, maybe don't necessarily apply to, uh, um, to charities the same, the same way. Uh, um, is that to elicit a response or uh, is, is there something specific you're looking for? Well, first of all, we're looking for the charity to un to be able to articulate something that they know about our family. Like we, if people don't know who we are and and our story and how hard we have worked, I, listen, we were manufacturing for for, for three generations. <laughs> there is no easy money in manufacturing. It is a brutal, tough way to make a dollar, and always has been. And I I think when we have these conversations with charities, we're looking for someone to understand how hard we have worked for the wealth that we've created that we are now going to pass on to charity because we feel like if they can tell our story, they will understand that we are not just looking for, I don't know, to fund something. We want extraordinary outcomes. We want them to be able to, to, to talk to us and explain in great detail how, how something is going to change. It's fun. I mean, it's fun. Why wouldn't we give uh, our philanthropy the same kind of rigor? 
it's the best part of the family meeting. Once we get through all of our governance issues and we all share our documents and there's no more secrecy of who gets what and when and how and where our parents are going to live and who's going to have power of attorney and who's going to, you know, who is going to, you know, weigh in on those decisions to resuscitate or not resuscitate because we've got those documents in place and had those repetitive conversations and because we're looking for clear language around irreversible brain damage or like that's all been done. That stuff is done. We spend a little bit of time on it, updating the documents, but then we just, we move into the fun part, which is how are we going to make a difference with our wealth? Where are we going to make a difference? And then we have them, we have these organizations come in and present and it's fun. It should be fun. We've worked hard for the wealth. This is the fun part of family meetings. The part that really brings generations together. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I'll I'll ask one more question and then uh, um, I'll uh, turn it back to Joe, who's received the questions. So if you have any questions you want to ask, get them in. Uh, get them in now. Um, but uh, one one tool that uh, that you mentioned in the book uh, that's a fascinating resource uh, is the Willing Wisdom Index. Uh, can you share a little more bit more about? Um, that and how it helps you helps people build estate plans. Uh, yeah, happy to. Uh, and one of the things that I that I well listen, I've been married almost thirty years, and my my wife is a is just a, a habitual list maker. She makes lists uh, to do lists, and uh, so I get one almost every day. Yeah, they're fantastic, sort of, not really, but anyway, I get them. And I thought I have never seen an estate planning to-do list, like a checklist. And so I, I was re I mean, I'm thinking, how can I reach more people? Not everyone's a reader. Not everyone will sit down and read an entire book. Uh, we got 12 million Canadians, 125 million Americans without wills, uh, 57 million UK citizens, uh, it, it, uh, 27 million rather, who don't have wills. Like this is a global disaster waiting to happen. I'm thinking, how can I reach more people? And, and so I developed the Willing Wisdom Index. It is the, I call it the ultimate estate planning checklist. It takes, are you ready for this? It takes a staggering eight minutes. Yep, it's eight minutes of your life that you'll never get back. But you know what you get at the end of eight minutes? You get a 20-page personalized report revealing the gaps in your estate plan. It actually tells you what you're doing well, but it also reveals the gaps. It helps, it, it, it provides you with some recommendations so that you can sit down with your family, make some major decisions, so that when you go visit your lawyer, you don't have a three-hour meeting, you have a 30-minute meeting because you're going in prepared, having made major decisions like who's your executor, who's your backup executor, who do you want as your power of attorney, your backup power of attorney, how do you spell their names? Do you know that short meetings with lawyers actually end up with, I don't know, smaller legal bills? Lawyers take instructions. They don't write wills. They draft them. They take instructions from clients. So this tool was really designed to help people in a very short period of time uh, make major decisions, reduce their legal fees, close the gaps in their estate plan, and start the most fascinating family conversations. And, uh, and so anyone who does this understand that it's a digital tool. So you just you get it, you'll get an, a link uh, from uh, from you folks, and just click on the link. Uh, insert your first name, not your last name. This is confidential. In fact, if you're really uncomfortable and you really don't believe that it's confidential, make a screen name up. Uh, Elvis apparently seems to be very popular these days. No one, I, when I say no one cares about your results, no one is looking at your results. There is an old saying with uh, with computers: good data in, good honest data in good, honest recommendations out. So when people are really honest with these, with the checklist, they're gonna get really amazing output, really amazing recommendations. It takes eight minutes, it's confidential, it's fast and super, super helpful. So if any of the ideas in today's call kind of resonated, even if they, you disagree with some of them, you'll find the Willing Wisdom Index an absolutely fascinating tool. And if you're even more curious, ask for a sample report. Uh, and I think when you see what this thing looks like, I, I know you'll want to invest eight minutes to get your own report. 
Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Tom. Um, and uh, Joe here again, by the way. Uh, I'll just mention if anyone is interested in uh, having a look at the Willing Wisdom Index, uh, they can send Sue uh, an email. Um, you should have received uh, your confirmation uh, for tonight's call from Sue, so you could just reply uh, to that email. Um, Tom, you know, I've heard you speak a few times now, and I'd have to say that every time uh, I do hear you, I, I learn something new every time, and it's always interesting and informative. So I'm quite glad that you've agreed to do this for us and our clients again. And uh, we do have a, a couple of questions that came through, but I, I'm going to save a number of them um, offline. We can chat about them, and, and they are personal to, to certain situations. Um, so we will uh, get back to our clients uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the call with them, but I do have one if you have a, some time here to discuss one more topic. Absolutely, I'd be delighted. Perfect, and, and this is something that has been coming up a bit more often, uh, you know, at the office here, and that's why I wanted to bring it up. Um, the question was uh, along the lines of, should we be choosing a family member to be an executor uh, or should we look at the professional trustee route uh, and is there pros or cons uh, to going either way that uh, that you could discuss today? Great question. In fact, if, if people are looking for a suggestion for what they might include as an agenda item for their very first family meeting, that would be a really great place to start. So you, it could, the conversation between parents and their children could go something like this. Hey guys, your mother and I uh, have to update our will and we thought this would be a really great time to have a family meeting and we'd like to invite our advisor to attend as well because uh, shockingly at some point we are going to die and we just want to make sure that everything moves really seamlessly and effortlessly and fairly and equally and so uh, so yeah, so we, we've invited our, are you guys available next week, next month? And so, and we really only want to tackle one issue. There's only one issue on the agenda, and that is the selection of the executor. And so before we, we don't want to just proclaim someone, we'd just like to ask you guys what you guys think. Maybe you guys want to do it. Maybe you want to do it. Maybe one of you want to do it. Maybe you all want to do it. Um, or maybe none of you want to do it, and we should use a, uh, a professional trustee. Do you see what has just happened in the phrasing of that? Do you see how the, the shift in power? A lot of us think that estate planning is, hey, we got the dough, we worked hard for it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this my way, and I'm going to do it in secret, and I'm going to do it in silence, as opposed to what I just described, which is, hey, I gotta do, we got to do this. We all have to have an estate plan, and I don't have all the answers. I want the best answers, and I think the best answers are in the room, and I want to unlock the best answers for this family. Let's have this meeting. There are some families... I can tell you, well, my, my brother and I were co-executors of my parents' estate. He moved to the U.S. We, got, we had to take him off as co-executor. That would subject my parents' estate to U.S. <laughs> to US law and U.S. taxation. So like, there are some really good practical reasons why uh, families shouldn't do it or all siblings shouldn't do it. Uh, uh, there's some outer province uh, rules as well. Or there's some examples where they should. Um, you know, maybe just sharing the burden and maybe they're both kids. Maybe the both are really good with detail. This is, look, being an executor is not fun. It is a serious, it comes with serious legal uh, ramifications if you don't execute the job well. And so it should be done by a professional trustee or maybe some people are really good with detail and they're really good administratively. Um, listen, what I'm trying to say is the answer's in the room. Explore it with your kids. Arrive at a decision that works for everyone. And then whatever you decide, share your decision and share your documents. In 1968, when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, he had a will. Guess who his executor was? It was his brother, John, assassinated five years earlier. Never updated the will. I, so, like, what were they thinking, right? We, we, we have to keep these documents up to date. And who we select as an executor, whatever you do, please give a copy of your will to your executor. Set your executor up to succeed and, and make sure that there's liquidity uh, so that you know, terminal uh, tax returns can be filed and taxes be paid. I mean, this is, this is what can be dealt with in a family meeting with, um, you know, with the advisor present. So um, it's a long answer to what, what on the surface looks like a very straightforward question, but seriously, you could have a, a one-hour family, an hour-and-a-half family meeting on that one subject. That would be a great place to start.
Yeah, and I think that, uh, you know, was a great, as you said, a great place to start and a great question and, uh, and, and again, an excellent answer. Um, so I'll pass it off to Adam for our uh, conclusion here as uh, we're reaching uh, eight o'clock. So I, I want to thank you, Tom, for taking the time to uh, join us and speak to uh, um, clients through this webinar format. Uh, you're our uh, first special guest that we've uh, we've exposed uh, um, to clients uh, in this new traditional or or new way. And uh, and I want to thank everybody who's who's in attendance tonight. And if you have any questions uh, on it, on any of the items we discussed or um, the Willing Wisdom Index or the Willing Wisdom book, uh, reach out to uh, any one of the team members or Sue. Uh, and if you have any specific estate questions, uh, um, reach out to your primary advisor and we, we'd be happy to, happy to help. Um, and Tom, we're looking forward to have you join us again for a follow-up presentation uh, um, the end of January, uh, um, every, everything uh, permitting. Oh, well, Adam, thank you. And Paul, thank you for, for both having me on. Uh, this is a sub, it is an enormous subject. I know we have just tipped our, uh, uh, dipped our toe in the, in the, uh, in the shallow end. There's so much more we can cover. And, uh, and I really feel privileged to be able to share some of these ideas. So with, uh, with that, I'll, I'll say good night to everybody and, uh, stay safe on a, on a snowy one. Hopefully, Everybody, uh, everybody, uh, unlike me, is home already. Have a great night.